If you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 21. And today is Palm Sunday, and we're going to be looking at this amazing event that takes place in Jerusalem. And this is really uh, one, of, one of my favorite times of the year, of course. It should be for every believer. In fact, it should be probably the most wonderful time of the year. And I, I'm tempted to play that Christmas carol uh, next Sunday, you know, Sunday morning. Uh, because really, Easter Sunday is the most wonderful time of the year, if you think about it. If there is no resurrection, there's no Christmas uh, at all. And it is because of what Christ did for us that we celebrate who Jesus is being born. And, and so certainly we're in, in that spirit of celebration, even starting today. Um, of course, the events leading up to the resurrection uh, are not necessarily fun to think about. They're not uh, enjoyable to think about at times when we look at the crucifixion and really this week leading up to the crucifixion uh, is not a fun time for Jesus. It's not a fun time for his disciples. It's not a fun time for anyone outside uh, who, who are beginning to uh, believe in Jesus. In fact, it's a very trying time. It's a very desperate time. This is probably one of the uh, most um, hostile times to begin to put your faith in Jesus. And we even see that we're not going to look at it today, but leading up to Jesus being crucified, we even see that one of his closest friends even denies him to just local strangers for that gripping fear that's associated with being a follower of Jesus. And it's because of the, the circumstances surrounding Jesus' death and then Jesus' death on the cross that this can be kind of a, a somber week for us. But it's that victory that Jesus has over death that victory that when he rises on the third day and ascends into heaven and conquers death and promises eternal life to those who put their faith in him, this is what we celebrate. This is why Easter, Resurrection Sunday, Resurrection Week is why it's the most wonderful time of the year. Amen? And so today we're going to be looking at this account where Jesus rides into Jerusalem this is known as the triumphal entry. If you look at any book, any gospel in your Bible, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, you will find the triumphal entry. You will find that header, the triumphal entry. And this is one of uh, this is an event that is very significant, of course, but there's, there are 11 events. This is one of 11 events that are in all four Gospels, that are recorded in all four Gospels, one of the 11. And so we can look at each one, each Gospel, from different authors, and we can look at the account of the triumphal entry and of course, what preceded the triumphal entry was Jesus triumphing over physical death. We looked at that last week. Who did Jesus raise from the dead? Lazarus, right? He called out to the grave. He commanded that dead body to rise up. Death had no authority at that moment over Jesus Christ. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Lazarus rose from the dead. And this was uh, the final messianic sign of Jesus that he would perform in the Gospels leading up to his 
riding into Jerusalem, leading up to his crucifixion. And this event sparked new belief in many who were witness to this event, but also those who had heard of this event. To the point where when Jesus rides into Jerusalem, there's great hope and celebration and joy and jubilee because their king who had even conquered physical death was riding in to save the day. On the flip side of this event, it also shows us really the tipping point. This event was the tipping point that led to the Jewish leaders to become so incensed at Jesus that they wanted to have him arrested and even killed for blasphemy. Right? We touched on how Caiaphas, the high priest, had mentioned this idea that wouldn't it be better for us to just, in, in a sense, just let's just kill Jesus and we'll solve this whole problem. They wanted him dead. So today, that leads us to where we are at today. So let's read Matthew 21. We're going to read verses 1 through 16 together. It says, Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David. They were indignant. And they said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes. Have you never read, Out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise? Lord, we thank you for your word. Speak to us as we examine it, as we reflect on this amazing event in history. Lord, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your word. Let it bring glory to you as we study it this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. This, uh, this passage begins, well, in verse 2, uh, with the account of the donkey. And as a child, as, as you probably have a similar uh, memory is that this was always a fun story to picture Jesus riding in on a donkey. Uh, I remember that I used to have a teacher who they had one of those uh, what are those those horses called that have that has the the broomstick and then the, the head of the horse okay and then they, they'd ride the donkey around the classroom and all the kids would laugh and uh, looking back, it, it was kind of 
silly that that, that was taking place. Um, but it was to, to bring joy, obviously, to children and to help them to remember the significant events. But as a kid, I, I always thought it was kind of silly that, that Jesus rode on a donkey. And it's a fun memory. It's a great thing to think about. And, and in fact... Uh, me and Hazel often read a book together called The Donkey Who Carried a King. Has, has anyone ever heard of this book besides me? Okay, there's a couple here. So this book was written by R.C. Sproul, and it's a great book that, obviously it's, it's a fictional book, that documents the life of, of the donkey that Jesus rode and how his whole life was really a mystery to him, that he didn't understand why no one would ever ride him, why he couldn't go and work like his brothers and and have significance and and feel fulfilled in what he was to do. But God had a plan for this donkey is how the story goes. And it tells the story of of God's plan for the donkey and how the donkey was to be the one to carry the king who was Jesus and how us as believers, we need to understand that God in his timing may have something very significant for us to do. And we need to not uh, be um, complainers or people who think that we are insignificant or anything like that, but to Know that God has purpose for everything, especially for his children. But throughout the story, and one of the main uh, attributes of this story is that it gives name to this donkey. If you notice in the Bible, there is no name for the donkey. This is a sad omission um, by all four authors. I believe this donkey probably had a name, and so... This book makes it easy for us. And so in the Bell family, the donkey's name is... Anybody? Davy. Davy the donkey. And so Davy the donkey uh, is what we call this donkey. Anyway, um, this is Hazel's favorite book, and she often talks about Davy the donkey. And... And in fact, it gives another detail in that book. It gives the name of of Mary's donkey as she rode pregnant uh, into Bethlehem. And and that donkey's name was Barnabas. Okay, so a little fictional Bible history for you there today. Um, The reason I bring up this story, uh, there's really not a good reason, but I just wanted to share it with you today. But behind this cute story of Davy the donkey And the donkey in general lies great significance in the historicity of this donkey. Okay, there's great significance for Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. And that is that this was prophesied by the prophet Zechariah over 500 years before Christ. Over 500 years, it was prophesied by the prophet Zechariah. And I'd like to read that verse real quick. It's in Zechariah 9, 9. And it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous, and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. This is just one more reason to believe that Jesus was the Messiah. This is just one prophecy out of many, out of over 200 prophecies of Jesus. And this shows us that Jesus was the prophesied Messiah. That this event in Zechariah, this prophecy, was being fulfilled by Jesus. It wasn't just that he was riding on a donkey for no reason. No, Jesus sent his disciples to go find the donkey so that 
his disciples and that those reading this book and that those who knew the Old Testament would see this prophetic fulfillment. Additionally, we see that the crowd's response to Jesus riding in on the donkey, it shows that they believed that he was the Messiah. And I believe this uh, display of Jesus riding in on the donkey bolstered that belief that he was the promise by God through the Old Testament prophets. I want to point something out regarding the coats. It says here in verse... Uh, it says here in verse... Um, where are we at? Six, eight? Verse eight, most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road and others cut branches from the trees. So we see that the crowd was spreading their cloaks on the road. Well, what does this mean? Well, if we look at 2 Kings uh, chapter 9 really quick, flip back to 2 Kings chapter 9. We see an example of something similar. And this is when uh, Jehu was anointed king by one of the prophets sent by the prophet Elisha. So in 2 Kings chapter 9, we pick up in verse 4. It says, So the young man, the servant of the prophet, went to Ramoth Gilead. And when he came, behold, the commanders of the army were in council. And he said, I have a word for you, O commander. And Jehu said, To which of us all? And he said, To you, O commander. So he arose and went into the house. And the young man poured oil on his head, saying to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anoint you king over the people of the Lord over Israel. And then verses 7 through 10 goes on to describe the judgment God is going to pour out on Ahab and Jezebel who were evil, as you know. In verse 11, it says, When Jehu came out of the servants of his master, came out to the servants of his master, they said to him, Is all well? Why did this mad fellow come to you? And he said to them, You know the fellow and his talk. And they said, That is not true. Tell us now. And he said, Thus and so he spoke to me, saying, Thus says the Lord, I anoint you king over Israel. Then in haste every man of them took his garment and put it under him on the bare steps, and they blew the trumpet and proclaimed, Jehu is king. This laying the cloaks down as Jesus rode into Jerusalem was symbolic of kingship. They were no doubt acknowledging that Jesus was their king. This was a celebration, a grand celebration. And so it wasn't just that they were throwing their clothes off in, in excitement. This was intentional. This was a statement of faith in Jesus as their king. And then it says also that they were waving branches from the trees. And, and today we call these the palm branches. Palm branches oftentimes were, oftentimes were waved uh, in celebration in this area, in Jewish culture, as a symbol of, of victory, as a symbol of almost... Uh, a, a, a nationalistic uh, celebration where today we would have a parade and, and what flag would we wave? The American flag, right? Th this was similar to that. They were waving the palm branches. This symbolized them recognizing Jesus as the Jewish Messiah, the Jewish king, not just any king. They weren't waving Roman flags, okay? They were waving the palm branches. 
And this word Hosanna, as they say, Hosanna in the highest, this word means, oh, save. And they were saying, son of David. This shows they recognized Jesus as the Davidic Messiah that was prophesied. So there was no doubt that these people, the Jewish people, were seeing Jesus as the Messiah. The question is, was he the Messiah that they wanted? Was he truly the Messiah that they thought they were celebrating? I want to jump back to verse 6 in, in Matthew uh, 21. I bring this up only because my kids ask me this question. Because in this account of the triumphal entry, there are some details that are omitted, and one of those uh, we're going to go over right now. In verse number 6, it says, The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. Right? Jesus had directed them to go and untie the donkey and to bring it to him, and that if anyone asks about it, why they were taking it, to say, well, our Lord has need of it. Well, in this passage, it just says the disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. So, of course, the obvious question that my children ask me is, Dad, did Jesus steal a donkey? And it sounds silly. It is kind of silly. But it really has significance. Because had Jesus stolen a donkey, what are one of the Ten Commandments? Thou shalt not Steal. Had Jesus stolen a donkey, Jesus would have sinned. And had Jesus sinned, he would not have been the spotless lamb. Now, this detail seems silly, but it reminds us just of how perfect of a life Jesus lived. His whole entire life, Jesus was the only human who was able to live a sinless life. Not only was he able to do it, but he had to do it. He had to live a sinless life because he had to be the spotless sacrifice whose blood was perfect because he was spotless. As, as Jay was mentioning as we were taking our commun communion, that there always had to be a sacrifice. There always had to be a blood sacrifice. And Jesus had to be a perfect spotless Sacrifice. So did Jesus steal a donkey? Was he a sinner after all? Of course, the question is, no, Jesus was not a sinner. If we look at Mark 11, this is the same account, the triumphal entry in verse 4. It says, they went away and found a colt tied at a door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they let them go. Okay, so Jesus did not steal a donkey. Phew. Okay, Jesus had permission. This was the fulfillment of the prophet Zechariah. And all is well. Jesus was perfect. Let's move along to verse 12 of chapter 21. Jesus does something very interesting here upon entering Jerusalem. The crowds are celebrating. They're welcoming their king, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest When it says in verse 10, when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, who is this? So there was quite a commotion here, a lot of attention on Jesus at this time. I mean, just think, just think of the crowds, think of the commotion, think of just the buzz that was in 
Jerusalem as Jesus enters. And what does Jesus do? The very first thing that Jesus does upon entering Jerusalem. What we see in verse 12. And Jesus entered the temple. He enters the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. Now for us today, this, this talk of pigeons and, and things like that, just, just picture today, okay, a modern day temple that they'd be selling, uh, they, they'd have massage chairs set up with, with people giving massages, okay, or, or they'd have uh, a, a virtual reality game or they'd be selling iPhones or, or something like that, okay? So this is what they were doing. They were taking a high traffic area dedicated to people coming to worship a holy God, and they were exploiting that traffic. They were soliciting for their own gain. In essence, making themselves just as important, if not more important, than a holy God. And this was Jesus' house. Jesus, upon entering Jerusalem, being called the Messiah, signifies his authority as the Messiah, by making his first stop, the temple. He doesn't go to Pilate, right? He doesn't try to establish his reign in Pilate's quarters. He doesn't go to Pilate and say, get out of here, I'm sleeping here tonight. No, he goes to the temple and begins to exercise his authority as the Jewish king, as the Messiah over those who are making a mockery of the house of God. And in verse 13, he says with authority, it is written, right? So here he's quoting scripture. My house shall be called a house of prayer but you make it a den of robbers. This this prophetic fulfillment we see in Isaiah 56, verse 7. Isaiah 56, verse 7 says this, These I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. This was a significant event, a very meaningful display of of Jesus' authority as the Messiah. And what it shows us today is Jesus' priorities. His, His main priority here was to go to the temple and clean out the temple. This was not the first time he did this. In fact, you might have been thinking as as we read this account of Jesus cleansing the temple, you might have been thinking back to at the beginning of my message where I said that the triumphal entry was one of the 11 events in all four Gospels. And if you were, if you just had to have happened to memorize all 11, you would have been maybe thinking, Wait a second. Isn't Jesus cleansing the temple in all four Gospels? And I will have to say, yes, it is. But the account in John is a different cleansing than the account in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The account in John was at the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. So at the very beginning of Jesus' public ministry... What's the first thing that Jesus does? He goes and cleanses the temple. He casts out those who are making a mockery of prayer, making a mockery of worship, trying to 
sell things in the market square. They're making a market square out of the place where the Gentiles could go and pray, defaming the name of God, defaming his house of worship. And so the symbolism here is that the beginning of Jesus' public ministry, he goes into the temple, and here we see upon arriving in Jerusalem at the end of his public ministry, the final time that he would arrive in Jerusalem before his crucifixion, the first thing he does is go into the temple and cleanse it again. One thing that this shows us is that Jesus, having to do it again, shows the depravity and sinfulness of man. That Jesus had already cleansed it, but over the next couple of years, people went back to their ways of sin. They went back to their ways of idolatry, of selfishness, of irreverence for the house of God. And this shows us the need of a Savior, the need of a better way. And Jesus, upon entering the temple, temple and cleansing it one final time, shows us his priority and, and his, his view of the house of God. And it shows us how we are to view the house of God, how we are to view this place, that as we gather together, that we are reverent before God. That as we worship the King of Kings, that our hearts are humbled before a holy God. And we see that he is the Messiah, but that he's not the Messiah that they wanted him to be. We see as a result of what Jesus is doing here and, and in the coming passages that the crowds begin to turn on Jesus. Some of the same voices that we are, we're looking at today that are saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, are the same voices that will say this Friday, crucify him, crucify him. Jesus did not live for the approval of man, but he lived for the glory of God the Father. Jesus wasn't concerned with the hatred towards him. He expected it. In fact, he... By him coming to this earth, he obviously already knew of the hatred towards God, of, of the sinful hearts of man. This is why our Savior came, to pay the ultimate price for our sin. Many people today are just like those in the crowd. There are certain things about Jesus certain things that Jesus has said in his word that people will try to twist, that people will say, I'll accept this part of Jesus. But when he says these hard things, these things that lead me to feel conviction, I don't, I don't really believe that about Jesus. This is what happened in this time. People began to turn because they didn't see Jesus as the Messiah that they thought he was going to be. They were expecting someone who would, what? Who would deliver them from the hands of Rome, right? From the oppression of Rome. When Jesus entered the temple, I think a lot of people thought either before he entered the temple or right after, he was going to go knock on the door and try to claim his throne over Rome. That's not what Jesus did, of course. Jesus was more concerned with the heart than the physical throne. 
And he was more concerned with saving the lost soul than having the approval of the people at this time. I want to look at something else towards the end of this passage. Matthew 21, picking up in verse 15. Actually, it started in 14. It says, And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Now, it's one thing to be indignant at children shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. I mean, I can't picture a more beautiful sight. Right? I mean... To see my children praising the Lord is one of the most valuable treasures that I could ever possess. But they were so enraged at Jesus that the sight of these children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David. I I just can't believe that. It's, It's... just shows the the blindness that they had towards Jesus. But not only that, they had seen Jesus healing people in the temple. He entered the temple. The blind and the lame came to him, and he healed them. And the chief priests saw what he had done, and they were indignant. And they even had the audacity to say out loud, do you hear what these are saying? Ridiculing the children. For seeing this man perform a miracle, healing a blind man, and praising him for doing that. Jesus has a response to them. He says, have you never read out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies you have prepared praise this this reflects the sentiment that Jesus shares with us in another account where he's talking about the faith of a child and how us as adults sometimes get stuck in our own pride and our own experiences because we know better and we've seen this before and it's happened many times that we tend to lack trust in Christ. We tend to lack the faith to get through something, through Jesus. And here we see just the flat out rebellion in the hearts of the Jewish leaders against Jesus. It stemmed from their pride. Think of the power that they had in society, the comfort they had, the praise that they received before Jesus arriving on the scene. If you were a Pharisee, you were the guy. You were were the top dog. You were the top religious leader. And everybody who wanted to follow the law looked to you as their source of wisdom, as their source of uh, encouragement in the law. You were of high stature. They did not want to lose that. Sometimes in our lives, we can become full of pride or afraid to lose certain things that we are unwilling to give them to the Lord. We are unwilling to sacrifice things to the Lord in worship because of our pride. This is what is happening here. This quote that Jesus says is another prophecy in Psalms 8-2 that says, Out of the mouth of babies and infants you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. So we see here that in this passage alone there are three prophecies that Jesus is fulfilling. 
And what Jesus does here in the temple makes it very evident that he is acting with supernatural authority. There is only so much that you can deny. He's healed Lazarus. He's healed the blind man. He's healed the lame man. And here in the temple, people who have seen these miracles, there are people coming into the temple to receive their healing. Because why? Because they already know that Jesus has been doing these miracles. And Jesus continues to heal. There's no denying the power of Jesus. And so at this point, there's only one solution for the Jewish leaders, and that is to have Jesus arrested, and if it be so, have him killed for the sake of their own pride and power. And so as we look past the triumphal entry, we look ahead to the crucifixion, we might have a tendency to think that for a moment, Jesus was defeated. For a moment, the the church hung in the balance. That, That at times it can look like Jesus failed or was failing. Because how can we look at the cross and and see our Lord and Savior hanging there, helpless, being beaten, being humiliated. How is that victorious? There might be times in our lives or there might be seasons of victory within the church that might look like defeat. When you look around the world, there are areas... Uh, all, over the, all over the world today, there are, there are people who do not have it like we do here, who are physically persecuted for their faith. You have children in other parts of the world whose parents are killed in front of their very eyes for professing the name of Christ. On the outside, this looks like defeat. Yet, You read reports of the church advancing, the kingdom advancing, hearts being transformed, people's lives being changed, people professing Christ. That's victory. That's the kingdom of God advancing. That is the power of God going forth through the the speaking of the gospel to change the hearts and minds of those who prior to turning to Christ would have eternity in hell, but now have victory through Christ. And so as we look at the cross, it's an example to us that sometimes victory doesn't always look like victory. But yet we know through the cross, we know that God's plan was being fulfilled. We know that God's victorious plan was being accomplished through Jesus going to the cross. If Jesus does not suffer on the cross, there is no victory over sin. Jesus has to suffer. This is God advancing his victorious plan through history. I want to encourage you today. Jesus is victorious today. Jesus is victorious today. Right now, Jesus wants to use us to advance his kingdom today. I want to read you just a few verses that talk about the reign of Christ today. I want to encourage you with these. Let let these encourage you as we read these in closing. Ephesians 1.21 says, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. Jesus has all rule and authority today. Matthew eleven twenty seven 27 says, all things have been handed over to me. This is Jesus 
to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the, the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. Jesus has all things in his hand today. Philippians 2, 8 and 9 says, And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. This is a perfect picture of what I just described, that Jesus hanging on the cross was a sign of victory. We see that Jesus rewards him for that event, right? It says, being obedient to the point of death, even the death on a cross, for this reason God exalted him and gave him the name above every name. This was a victorious act by our Savior to conquer sin. Even though it looked like pain, and it was painful, excruciating pain. The, the word excruciating comes from uh, the, 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 the description of an actual crucifixion. Jesus felt pain, but it was victorious as he took our sin upon himself. Colossians 2.10 says, In him you have been made complete, and he is the head over all rule and authority. Listen, if you are in Christ today, if Jesus is your Savior, you are complete. You have been made new, a new creation. You have been freed from your sin. You can walk in victory today. And as we walk in victory, we gain ground for Jesus Christ here today. We advance the kingdom of Christ today. It's advancing all over the world today. 1 Peter 3.22 says, Who is at the right hand of God? This is talking about Jesus. Who is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers had, had been subjected to him. Angels and authorities and powers had been subjected to him. Past tense. Jesus has authority over the enemy. We need to talk like that. We need to act like that. We need to pray like that, that Jesus has authority, that he's given uh, us the ability to pray in faith his authority. We could speak his authority over our lives, over our family, over our city through prayer. John 3.35, we read this through our series in John. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Two more. Philippians 2.10. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And then my favorite, Matthew 28. The Great Commission, verse 18. Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus has all victory today. Us as his children have victory over sin. And we are commissioned to go. Not because we're going to lose but because he has all authority, because he's commissioned us, because he's, he's won. When he died on that cross, he defeated Satan. What did we see the devil tempting Jesus with in the wilderness? 
Look around. I, I can give you all the kingdoms of, of this world. He was tempting Jesus to forego the crucifixion. He was tempting Jesus to go against the prophecy of Scripture because the enemy, just like he did in the garden, knew that if he could get Jesus to, to in, his, in, in the enemy's deceitful way, to do something contrary to the word of God, the whole plan of God would be thwarted. See, Jesus had to endure the cross to possess victory over Satan. He had to endure the cross to do it the way that God had designed for him to do it. So the cross was Jesus taking victory from the enemy. And obviously, when he rose again, that was the final blow to the enemy, conquering death, hell, and the grave, conquering sin. This is why Jesus told us to go. He has all authority, and he's commanded us to teach everyone to observe all that he has commanded. This is our commission to make disciples everywhere that we go to walk and talk as followers of Christ. And so on this Palm Sunday today, throughout this week, as we approach Good Friday, as we remember the cross, as we look ahead to the glorious resurrection, let's remember what this was all for. This was all for Jesus conquering sin defeating death so that we could be right before God when we turn to him, that by the grace of God alone, through faith in Jesus Christ, we are saved. And we have this good news on our lips. We have this good news everywhere that we go, everything that we do, everything we put our hand to, can be a sign of worship and praise to Jesus Christ. So as we go from here today, let's, let's be celebrating the triumph of Jesus, the victory of Christ in all of life, in every area of life. Amen? Lord God, we thank you so much for your love, for the world, for your power over sin, for your victory over death and the enemy. I thank you that I serve the true God, the true Messiah, the one who came not to help us to overthrow Rome, not, not to help us get through our little circumstances here and there, but you came to empower us. You came to give us victory over sin. You came to break the bondage of death, of spiritual death, of spiritual bondage, of the lies of the enemy. You came to give us freedom from death. That as we look to you, as we follow the good shepherd, as we put our faith in Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven and we are set free from a life of sin and shame. And we are made new. We are born again into newness of life to be men and women who follow you, who obey your word, who love to obey your word. And help us to be carriers of that good, precious gospel, that it would be on our lips, that it would be in our hearts everywhere that we go. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.